dude, it's a, it's a fucking gambler's mindset. It's like, dude, next week. No, next week's the week, man. I'm telling you, exactly. next week's the week. And it's just, it's never the fucking week. You're listening to Let's Talk Fantasy Football, where men of fantasy genius have realized. Hey, guys, we don't need real football skills to dominate on the fantasy field. So slap on your pads and grab your helmet. Shit's about to get real. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another edition of Let's Talk Fantasy Football. I am your host, Nick Shrek, and joining me tonight is the one, the only, Vinny Gonzalez. Vinny, great to have you here. Uh, it's great to be here, Shrek, as always. As always, man, talking fantasy football with the best. And uh, we've got uh, an interesting podcast for you guys coming at you because it's it's different from our format here as we're rolling into July. Uh, you know, we're looking at – we've already talked about a lot of rookie ADPs and uh, a bunch of guys that have been up and down the boards. We've picked out a few names here that still we're going to talk about their ADPs, what we think's right, wrong, how it affects their teams – uh, and then we're going to talk about some facts that we think you guys should be aware of uh, as you go into the 2017 season. And then coming at you next week, we're going to have a breakdown of Let's Talk Fantasy Football's very first mock draft of the 2017 season. And uh, there's bound to be some madness in there. We've already heard from Don on last the last podcast about his love for Jay Ajayi. And uh, we're going to have to see how these rookies actually fall once we start drafting them um, instead of just judging the ADPs here from afar. So, uh, Vinny, once we start doing it for real, uh, things change quickly, right? Oh, yeah, dude. Once we start getting the feel of, like, who's taking who, what's going on, and just more realistic trends when you do it with actual people as opposed to, um, you know, more or less when you're doing them now. It's like a handful of people and a handful of computers going off of ADP. So once you get real people doing it, it's a lot more intense, a lot more realistic, and you start to realize what you can and can't do uh, when you'll be drafting for real. Yeah, I mean, and you realize how much you truly don't know or what you might do under pressure. I mean, last year we did our first mock of the season. I lost my ability to speak for some reason on the recording, but I took Arian Foster and everyone lost their minds. Um, so I know all too well what uh, the pressure can do to you. So, uh, yeah, look at that, guys. I drafted Arian Foster. He retired and led to the rise of Jay Ajayi. So that is why uh, we see, you know, Don's. that's Don's poster trial this year. So, We'll, uh, we'll see if that works out for him. But before we jump into ADPs here today, guys, we're going to give a quick shout-out to ViewPicks, where you can play fantasy football live while watching the game on TV. Visit ViewPicks.com to sign up for the beta testing that will begin preseason week one in August. So, all right, Vinny, let's get down to business. We've got three names here on the outline today, and we're going to start with one guy who I think is – he epitomizes, and just because of his spot in the ADPs, how bad running backs really are. And I think for me, the realization truly hit. We've talked about it all offseason so far on the podcast, but it's really hit me now when last podcast we listened to Don talk about how Jay Ajayi was the last good running back at like 13 overall. Um, and, you know, this guy here, the Garrett Blunt's going fifth round. I don't remember the exact pick. Sixth. Round. Six round, six round first, I apologize. Yeah, first pick, sixth round. Uh, it's it's interesting because at first glimpse, I'm like, fuck that. That's too much, too expensive. But the more I look at him, the more intrigued I get because of like the awfulness that's just around him and what he could possibly do on uh, get, like in his new environment with the Eagles. Uh, the Eagles have an underrated O-line. They actually had Ryan Matthews get eight rushing touchdowns which is below um, – well, holy shit, we're still <laughs> – below pal is still fresh in my mind from the last podcast, <laughs> but uh, which is Blunt's specialty uh, when you get down there. And uh, I have it – where is it? Matthews – Ryan Matthews was in the top five percentile for rush attempts within the five-yard line last year. Damn. That's Blunt's bag, man. So, yes, it is. <laughs> if that's the Eagles game and they're playing it, they picked up Blunt for a reason. It was a great sign for them, and if – he's going to be a touchdown machine, which he potentially could be. It's looking like his floor is somewhere around like six to eight, like six at very worst, eight. Um, you'll be happy if you get it and then possibly room for more since uh, we don't know entirely like who is going to be on the Eagles roster once it all starts. We can yep. imagine Blunt will be there for sure. We don't know what's up with Brian Matthews. Darren Sproles is 45. Just kidding. He's, I don't know, but he's up there, man. Yeah, yeah. So um, they had a total of 14 running back touchdowns to go around 
there's there's room for Blunt to get a fuckload of those. So I'm uh, I'm pretty intrigued at his current ADP, especially with the dudes that are around him. Just wanted to know what you thought about Blunt. Yeah, I mean, like you said, it's that weird spot because you, you, know, you look at that drop off from Jay Jai down the board. You know, we talked about Adrian Peterson before the podcast. Um, you know, real quick, uh, you know, his ADP there right above CJ Anderson. And again, for those of you that uh, are just tuning in, these these ADPs are coming from fantasyfootballcalculator.com, 12 team PPR leagues. Um, and uh, yeah. Like you said, man, there's a lot of touchdowns to go around in Philly. Brian Matthews, I, we don't even know if he's, like you said, be on the roster. Darren Sproles is just a different kind of back, um, you know, besides being old. Um, he's a different kind of back. So, LeGarrette Blunt is – you got to imagine they're going to feed him that – feed him the ball. Um, yeah. You know, they bring in Alshon. That offense should be moving. The O-line, like you said, is better. I'm cool with it. I mean, he's there with – you know, we talked about Bly Powell, and he's literally the third pick in the sixth round. So that's probably why you got a little tongue tied there as well. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm okay with the price because you got, you said you've got to figure that six to eight touchdown range. You're hoping for some bonus. He's a bruiser, you know, again, ups, the upside is there, particularly with the, all the question marks at running back. Um, I would spend the pick for LeGarrette Blunt there uh, at the beginning of the sixth round. Yeah, I completely agree. The only thing I'm worried about is it would be really good for Blunt if Ryan Matthews was cut or left or went somewhere else, but that will increase his ADP, I would imagine, at least like a round or two immediately. Yes. yes. So that's like a, a the best case scenario for Blunt and fantasy owners, but maybe not your pocket when you're looking to spend some cheap stuff on Blunt in the sixth round when he might bump up to like the fourth round. Yeah, I mean, because if he – so you're right. I didn't even think about that with with if Ryan Matthews, which I, I think a lot of people expect him to be cut. You know, so if he jumps up – if he jumps up exactly one round, Vinny, he's going right around the pick where Doug Martin is there at the beginning of the fifth round. And I don't think that's where he stops. He probably gets into that fourth round there, probably on the back end, assuming there's mm-hmm. no Ryan Matthews. So you're talking Spencer Ware, Ty Montgomery, Carlos Hyde territory. Um, which again, like you said, the running back is position is very yeah, relative man. to what you like. Um, but whew, I, you know, a round and a half jump. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know how I feel then. Then I may, I, I'm probably going to back off of some LeGarrette Blunt love. See in that hypothetical situation where Matthews isn't around anymore. Uh, I think I'd still be willing to pay that price for Blunt because when you look at it, if it's just going to be him and Sproles, those two couldn't be like more Different. of the antithesis of each other. Yeah. Because Sproles is like the pass catching dude. They're like completely slated in their roles. So I would be possibly even more comfortable with taking him because I think he'll get the early down work for sure. He'll get the goal line stuff. I mean, occasionally like they have packages where Sproles will be in, but the touchdown upside for Blunt is fucking sky high. Yeah, that's tr- that's true. And I mean, I. Yeah, I mean, I want to say the one worry I have is if they bring try and try and bring somebody else in that gets cut from another roster or, or you know whatnot to replace Ryan Matthews behind him. Well, um, they do have guys like Wendell Smallwood, well, Smallwood. and Kenyon Barner still. Oh, that's so, true. Yeah, it's not like they have a shallow uh, depth chart yeah. there at running back. So they have guys to fill in, and those guys are way more or less featured dudes. So I think if they're just going to take like a handful of carries throughout the season. I'm still all right with it. That's true. It's, that's not LeGarrette Le- 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 Blunt's game anyway. So, uh, all right. I, I could be convinced to come along for the ride. Um, you know, I think if he <laughs> – I, I think if he gets to, like, Doug Martin territory, is pro- right now is probably where my ceiling would be. If he keeps creeping fifth, up. Fifth, fifth Like, top of the fifth round, I think, is kind of my ceiling on him. Um, that's fair. You know, yeah. if he creeps into the fourth there again, it probably more depends on – how my draft start shaping up in uh, you know in real time because like we said at the beginning of the, of the podcast you don't really know until you start you start drafting with real people you know because uh, the computers and the automated stuff makes it hard to get a, a real feel as you move down these rounds um, right. on what's going to actually happen as we go into it but now yeah, you make a good point on the on the Garrett Blunt there his price will probably rise. Um, Depending. I mean, we went to a lot of hypotheticals there. But, we we uh, did. I mean, I, I think that... It's not completely unrealistic, but... No, but technically it's a hypothetical. See. Technically it's a hypothetical. Um, all right, Vane, let's, uh, let's go to the other side of the country here and talk about uh, 
the Denver Broncos. Uh, Demarius Thomas, Emmanuel Sanders. Um, you know, their QB situation is uh, not great. Unclear at best. Um, you know, Trevor Simeon and uh, Paxton Lynch. Um, uh, that sucks. Um, because, well, you know, we'll start. I mean, I'll start here with, you know, Demarius Thomas. He set five year lows in catches. 90, uh, just over a thousand yards last year and five touchdowns. He was wide receiver 21 in PPR points per game. Um, and prior to that, he was top 15 for four straight years. So, um, I, I don't know. Um, that kind of like, sucks. It, it does. But when you look at, he's playing with fucking Peyton Manning and then he goes to Trevor Simeon and he still puts up a great season. So, like last season, I think was like the bottom of the barrel for DT, and he was still fucking great. Yeah, I mean, he was still wide receiver twenty. I think, yeah, you're right. You're right. I mean, if it stays Simeon, you know, you at least know what your floor is. I guess we'll say. Um, you know, Paxton Lynch apparently looks good again. I haven't watched any tape, uh, you know, doing that shit. But um, did you see him come in? Uh, I think it was the Buccaneers Broncos game when uh, Simeon went down with the shoulder injury. Mm-hmm. And Paxton Lynch came in. He was not awful. He Which was is, he wasn't sharp, but he was uh, he was back okay. and he yeah. was yeah you know rookie and trying to make moves outside the pocket and stuff like that. He made a nice play to Emmanuel Sanders on a touchdown, I believe. But uh, yeah, it could like the situation sounds way worse than I think it is because those two wide receivers are way up there in terms of tandems in the NFL, uh, and I think no matter what quarterback, you're still going to get steady play out of these two dudes. Yeah, uh, that's fair. I mean, I'm just looking here at the stats are coming to you courtesy of Evan Silva of RotoWorld.com. You know, and he says right here, you know, Demarius Thomas has been a 90-plus catch receiver for five straight years. So that was even last year with the bad year. Um, he's had zero missed games during that time span. And he, like you said, he says here he offers security kind of at his current ADP. Um over the past three years, only Antonio Brown has seen more raw targets than Demarius Thomas. So, like you said, even though it was a super down year, uh, he still played well and performed. And you can't you can't expect the situation to be any worse this year than it was, quote unquote, last year. Right, exactly. And um, the the thing where his value kind of takes a hit is just he didn't have explosive games like he did with Peyton Manning. Yes. So you're kind of getting the floor play every week with room for him to do well, but you're kind of just really hoping at that point, like to get like a 25 point game would be probably pretty rare in this offense. That's uh, uh, not, not superstar level, but definitely solid. Yep. And, and uh, Emmanuel Sanders here is going with a six pick in the seventh round versus Thomas is going 10th pick in the the third. third. So, you know, I mean, it sounds like a cop out answer, but I mean, I'd rather have uh, Emmanuel Sanders at almost the eighth round pick because of the deep ball uh, threat here. Um, You know, it says right here that uh, according to Evan Silva, that Sanders crushed Thomas's average depth of target by two full yards and remains the preferred deep threat of the team. Um, So I think at the price and the long ball value, I'd probably own Sanders a little bit more boomer bust. Um, but just because when I look at Demarius Thomas at 10, I mean, I guess, I don't know. I, I'd like Keenan Allen, obviously, but Allen Robinson's a question mark. He's been super – he was super touchdown dependent last year. Otherwise, he was shitty without the touchdown. Yeah. Um, Alshon Jeffrey, we'll see what we're going to get in Philly. We talked about Terrell Pryor last podcast. He's great. So I'm almost talking myself out of it. But I think I'd still take uh, <laughs> Sanders. I'll stick to my point there and take uh, Emmanuel Sanders at the end of the seventh. Yeah, Sanders is a huge value going that late. He's yep. you know consistently a thousand yard receiver, and then I think even last year he, if he didn't get a thousand yards, he was close. So at, at the very worst, you're getting a thousand yard receiver and halfway through the seventh round, which is pretty sweet. Yeah, who and he's a deep ball guy clearly. Um, so for the boomer, you know the more boomer bust, but so what? At that point, if you can get a you know a guy like that who's going to come out with value, just just go. He's got a good floor. He's got to go yeah. for it. Their, their running game is not, you know, they're not going to have a – I don't think they're going to have a great running game. Um, uh, sure. I, don't, I don't think so either just because their offensive line is pretty weak. Yep. It's yep. Not, definitely not the strength of the team. So if they can't get the run game going, 
there will be a lot of passing to go they, around. They got to sling that piggy. They got a tough uh, run defense schedule again. Right now, that means everything. We'll see what it looks like when we get into the season. But as of right now, that plus a makeshift line means a ton of balls in the air, regardless of whether it's Simeon or, or Paxton Lynch. So, yeah. um, good things to come. You know, you've 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 definitely shaped my view a little bit on Demarius Thomas as we've talked through uh, that kind of being his floor. Uh, yeah, everyone's kind year. of being mean to him, dude. He's going uh, like he's been consistently going in around like the at at worst like in the second round. And now all of a sudden he's just dropping out. Like last year, I thought it was bad too. Yep. And he's just continuing to fall. So value, value, big time. They kind of have um, an Amari Cooper, Michael Crabtree situation where they're both fantastic, and one is going much later than the other, but maybe not for a huge glaring reason. So the uh, like Crabtree's the value. Mm-hmm. Emmanuel Sanders is the value. Uh, Absolutely. Ups, upside is Cooper. DT is upside. So yep. it's kind of the same situation, a uh, little bit of rounds back, but same thing going on, same dynamic. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and then the third guy I have on this list here, uh, Vinny, Kareem Hunt. Uh, he's climbing up the draft board, which I think we we expected when we talked about him. It might have been the first podcast or, or the beginning of the second one we had, we had hit on him. Um, but, you know, from, you know, we'll call it um, May, we'll say May 29th, we'll say we podcasted. He was – the 11th pick in the 12th round. Uh, he's now up to the 10th pick in the 8th round. I expect that to continue to climb um, as people see him play in the preseason, as he's taking more snaps with the offense. Um, you know, I th- still don't know if he gets the job to, to start the season, but I think it becomes his job at some point in 2017 in Kansas City. Yeah. Uh, I was just thinking, do you think people could misinterpret his preseason use if – Andy Reid's going to go out there and give this guy a ton of carries. We could see his fucking AD, ADP skyrocket, even though maybe they're just giving him reps to just kind of give him yes. the reps, you know, for the sake of it, even though <laughs> like his West and uh, fuck West and Ware have been in that offense for a while now and yeah. they kind of got it. So if they want to give Kareem Hunt more carries than he might get throughout the regular season, I think this could be a huge misinterpretation during the, during the preseason here. I agree. I mean, I'm I'm okay with his climb right now because it makes sense. Whatever, ninth, essentially a ninth round pick. You're throwing darts at that point if you want to believe anyway. Yeah. Get someone on your bench, they sit. But um, yeah, if, if he, you know, I'm trying to think. I can't think of who it was last year, but there was somebody, and I remember sending out a tweet, and it was just like a, you know, a chart with an upwards arrow, and it was like the ADP of so and so. They broke off like a 70 yard run. Oh, um, is it um, is it a Patriot guy? It might have, it might have been. I, I honestly can't remember. But I watched the preseason game, and it was like a guy that was already on the upswing. Was it Jonas Gray? It might have been Jonas Gray. And he broke like um, a sixty yard something, and it, uh, it, I, I can't. I, I, it, I'm yeah. gonna, I'll have to go back after the podcast and pull it up. But literally, I watched it happen on TV, and I, I just I tweeted out. I was like ADP, and it was a chart of just the arrow up because he was already rising, and after he broke it off. He just he did he shot up draft boards even more, mm-hmm. and it it is a possibility here with the same scenario where Hunt he's look he's a speedster he looks good he doesn't you typically fumble the ball which is a big thing for Kansas City when they don't turn the ball over the team typically wins, um, so I think it could be misinterpreted by people and drive his draft price way up um, at which point I would be out, um, but uh, yeah. you know it it can create someone to overpay and it could create the opportunity if the chiefs aren't willing to go to him early enough, someone's going to overpay. They may end up cutting him down the road. If you know, you get the week five, six, you start needing to make some waiver moves and he's not, nothing's happening. Um, which then creates opportunity, you know, again, down the line, the chiefs have done it with their handcuffs, their, you know, their backups. They've, they like to move people around pretty quickly. So just, just food for thought. Again, it's, it's, you know, June, end of June, beginning of July, but, um, Still should be some movement on Kareem Hunt, but I do like him. Yeah, just just in general, you shouldn't put a lot of stock in the guys that you're going to have to wait, like almost guaranteed. Like, yes, we possibly could not see this guy for half the season. So you don't you don't really even even late in the eighth round, ninth round, you can still get other guys that are going to see the field at different positions, and they'll have a bigger payoff. Like they'll they'll ha- they'll add value to your team as opposed to throwing an incredible dart on someone that could possibly not even see the field for a long time. Yeah. And, you know, and that brings up a good point. You just kind of made me think about this now is a, a lot of people forget. And I think we talked about this when we talked about Doug Martin and his suspension is 
a lot of people forget that the fantasy football season, it, it isn't a 17 week season like the NFL is. You know, you're essentially playing 12 weeks to get to win a bunch of games to get into the playoffs. Right. You know, because if you're not in contention by just say, well, we'll say week 10, but, you know, I don't know the exact number, you're pretty much done. So if the guy doesn't have a starting job by week six, you know, and you're still trying to use him, your team's probably not in good shape if you're banking on needing him. If you get him, he's a bonus. Great. But if you're spending a six round pick here and now you're stuck holding him for six or seven weeks, by that point, your team's bed's kind of made, you know, unless you've been hanging on. Like, so like you said, don't put too much stock into a guy that you don't know you're not going to be able to use because at that point, by the time you could use him, it may not matter. It may get you out of what leak bitch, but it's not going to get you to a championship, which is the ultimate goal. Um, That's true, man. And then uh, another point that can be made is these guys become burden on your, uh, burdens on your team and they could possibly screw you out of picking up guys that are hot during the season. Yep. Like if you have Kareem Hunt, you have invested, let's say if it stays around this ADP, minimum like, you know, eighth eighth round pick for you. You're going to have that in the back of your mind while you're like wondering if you should pick up like a hot wide receiver or a running back that could possibly be more helpful to your team. And you're just like, you're not wanting to drop Hunt because of the potential that he he may never have that season. So it's it's just always something that people kind of forget when they're taking people that – these, these guys can weigh you down more than you think. Dude, it's a, it's a fucking gambler's mindset. It's like, dude, next week. No, next week's the week, man. I'm telling you, exactly. next week's the week. And it's just – it's never the fucking week. It's never the fucking week. <laughs> it's like um, when you're playing roulette and you just keep betting black even though it's been red like 16 times in a row. You're like, this is it. It's this coming. is it. <laughs> then you're like, you know what? I'm putting it all in, all the money I got left. And then it comes up green. And you're like, son of a – all right, all right. Well, I'm out of here. Back. Yeah, like, man. <laughs> That's 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 definitely uh, looking on the bright side, um, but yeah, you know we'll see what happens with Kareem Hunt. But definitely good points to keep in mind that apply not just to Hunt guys, but some of these other rookies that you are watching shoot up draft boards. Leonard Fournette, McCaffrey. Um, again, we've talked about these guys. We talked about the values of Jonathan Stewart. Keep it in mind. You spend a fucking you know a pick high up on McCaffrey and he's not starting. That sucks. Yeah, that sucks. Fucked. Fucked. Um, so don't, I, I have a guy that we could bring up that's pretty much identical with Kareem Hunt in terms of situation. Yeah. Um, with uh, where the fuck do you go? Dalvin Cook. Because we don't know exactly what you know Minnesota situation is there. They could be running Latavius Murray like the Raiders did last year. Yep. So when you're banking on a dude to start, like we like we've been harping on, it, you, you just you just don't know. And he's even worse. He's like in the middle of the sixth. Yeah. He's he's li- he is above. Latavius Murray by almost by two full rounds. Yeah, see that shit I don't get. Like I'm not a huge Murray fan, especially this year. Yes, but I'm not a, like in general. I'm not a huge fan of what's going to go down with the running back situation in Minnesota. But that's no. another. We <laughs> can say that for a whole other podcast. <laughs> yeah. But like just because he was, you know, like like drafted to potentially be the dude. Like they, the Vikings went out and got Latavius Murray. They didn't do it for no reason. They paid him a bunch of money. Like they, they want him to be the guy, at least for the short term. Yeah, exactly. And just to throw a six round pick, like I know running back's bad, but you don't have to panic like that, dude. He can this ADP should be pushed way down. Even, 100%. even like Kareem Hunt level is, I think, too high. So you know, Yeah, that, I agree. I mean that they shit should, in the ninth round. Yeah, they should at least be in burst. Latavius Murray is the starter. He should be the starter, barring an injury or something like that going into the start of the season. Again, if you want to dabble in the Minnesota backfield, that's your business. But I wouldn't advise it being Dalvin Cook in the sixth round when if you want to dabble, I'd rather dabble with Latavius in the eighth um, just based on pure value, um, which, again, value is a relative term. But for the eighth round, it does not make sense for uh, Dalvin Cook to be up there. No way. You're talking about names like floating around the six, like Jimmy Graham, Tyler Eifert, Delaney Walker, uh Stephon Diggs, Willie Sneed, Calvin Benjamin. Like, like guys that are actually going to help your team. Like yeah. whether it's Jamison Crowder, who we were talking about last podcast. Like, dude, so many other people that will be fantastic this year. Oh, that's that's sad. That's just sad. That's sad. That to is see. crazy. For a dude that might not start at all. Like he might not – like these guys could possibly not have a single start. We could be dead wrong about that. But right now there is nothing to prove – that these guys will see the field anytime soon. 
Well, I mean, I'll tell you what, Vinny, if you look at our track record, we're typically not wrong. So right. um, I don't see how we can be wrong here in Davin Cook. But in all seriousness, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, this is one that I would I would feel pretty strongly on. And I think you would agree that uh, we don't think we're going to be wrong, at least not for his current draft price. Um, yes. as, this- as of June 28th, we are all seeing, all knowing that <laughs> Evan Cook and Kareem Hunt will not be anything. Yeah, well, dude. As I of just- now. So, so uh, you know, I don't know what's going on. I mean, I'm just looking at his chart now. Since May 29th, he's up from the second pick in the eighth round to the seventh pick in the sixth round. So he's up almost almost two rounds since uh, – is somebody are. talk is like an expert talking him up or I mean that, I'm sure that could be a thing. I'm sure there are people out there talking him up. I mean, you know, again, people like to fall in love. They like to believe that they, you know, like Don talked about on last podcast, people get cute. You know, they believe they've got the inside track and they know, ah, well, Davis Murray's a bum, it's gonna be cook. I watched him play in college. Mm-hmm. You know, I, again, I don't know if that's what's driving him up here or you know, what expert out there is, you know, kind of the champion for him right now. Um, but I Right now, I think anybody that's championing for him is wrong. Yeah, I but, I don't I don't see it. I don't get it. At least at least not yet. Not yet. Not yet. We may be singing a different tune come late August, but uh, yeah. as far as we're concerned, late June, early July is not uh, not <laughs> Dalvin Cook time. So, uh, all right, guys, we're gonna to do a quick live read here, and uh, then we're gonna jump into just some some random fantasy football facts that uh, you know we've kind of, kind of stumbled upon here the ESPN has put together, just things we think are interesting to know, and uh, we'll go from there. So, guys, viewpicks.com, you can sign up right now, drop your email in there, get on their beta list. It's going to be preseason week one where you're going to be able to play fantasy football live while watching the games on TV. Uh, we're going to have the founder of View Picks on to the podcast very soon. He's going to be able to tell you firsthand how it's all going to work and why this is truly the new frontier of fantasy football. All right, guys. So here it is, fantasy football facts. And here's the thing, guys. The thing about facts is that you can find anything to support anything. If we wanted to come on here and champion Calvin Cook – or Calvin Cook. Whoops. Dalvin Cook, we, we, we <laughs> can come out here and find any stat that say this is why you want him over Latavius Murray. We could do it the opposite way. Um, so I just think stats are interesting in that way. You can always sell whatever story you want. It's just how good of a salesman are you really. Um, and uh, these stats are coming to you courtesy of ESPN. Uh, Matthew Berry has an article out right now, 100 facts uh, to know for your fantasy football season. And, uh, you know, we just kind of start scrolling through or picking out a few things. And, uh, you know, here's one, Vinny. It's not notable, but, you know, we talked about in the last podcast about Aaron Rodgers, Tom Brady, and Drew Brees are kind of that that top tier. Drew Brees kind of, you know, fills us out. Drew Brees has nine straight seasons of 30-plus touchdown passes. Um, no other team has ever done that. Um, and I think that just – that further solidifies kind of Drew Brees there and his value in that kind of top tier. Yeah, for sure. Drew, there's never any question about that, but it's Drew Brees has probably always been somewhere like getting drafted anywhere between the I don't know if he's ever been the first quarterback off the board, but definitely solid third, fourth, fifth yep. off the board. Always. Every year that he's been on the Saints guaranteed. Yep. So, you know, you know what you're getting with Drew Brees. Uh he always has one really bum ass game and you don't expect it. But other than that, the dude is absolutely lights out. Yeah, you just you pray the one year it came during the fantasy playoffs, or it was like right, right up leading up to the fantasy playoffs, and he just put up a stinker. It was like yeah, man. He, flirted I mean, he, with, he threw five picks in a Thursday night game one time. Yep, yep. Against he, the Falcons, I think that was even in the Superdome, which was just like you, when you play Drew Brees at home, you're like sweet twenty points. Yeah, you're like I'm golden. I don't even have to watch this game. And he, he was like negative two, five. Negative two points, and he was up three, then he was down one, then he was at like finished at like five points. And you're like, God damn it. Well, it's been fun, but I definitely lost this week. Um, Vinny, another guy on here uh, that there's a couple stats on, and we talked about it before, um, and they kind of all tie together, actually. You know, Marcus Mariota, he's coming back from the injury, obviously, but so far I've heard all good things. The tight ends, it says from weeks five to 12 last season, no player scored more fantasy points than Marcus Mariota. Um, for his career, he's got 33 touchdown passes, zero interceptions in the red zone. And as we talked about with Decker before, uh, you know, Eric Decker from 2012 to 2015 was third in, in the NFL in red zone receptions and second in red zone touchdowns. 
So we could have a nice match made in heaven here in 2017. Oh, absolutely. And might I say, I, I absolutely remember those weeks because that was when I streamed Mariota and then dropped him as soon as he started playing good defenses. I got very lucky, but that was that was definitely fun, and it made me pay more attention to Mariota. And uh, he's definitely a fantastic player. The like the thing that you said about facts right before we started reading the facts, they can go either way. And reading that, it's just it sounds super cool, but that yeah. is unsustainable as fuck. <laughs> and it's going to be a story. It's crazy that he's thrown no red zone picks. Yeah. He's going to he's going to throw a red zone pick probably this season, probably a couple. And people are going to get all bummed out, but this shit happens. People throw them, and it's it's going to be like something wrong with Mariota. Like it's it's fine. He's not going to go thirty for zero for two years of football. It's just something that he's not going to sustain. So don't don't go like declaring him a superhero or anything like that yet. But he's definitely very talented, very good in the red zone, very accurate. But when you see stats that are almost too good, you should look at them even more and kind of expect them to regress a bit. Yeah, I, you're you're right, man. That is the beauty of stats: the supporting, and then the the you know you're like, yeah, Mariota champion. And it's like, all right, all right. Well, let's let's be realistic about what's <laughs> going on here. It's not all it's not all uh, sunshine and roses. Um, and here's some stuff on another QB. We touched on him last podcast when we talked about Martavis Bryant and uh, Antonio Brown. Ben Roethlisberger in 13 seasons uh, that he's been an NFL QB, he has played all 16 games a total of three times. Three times. So we know he's injury prone, but that definitely sucks. Um, and you know, we for those of you that don't know, but you should all know this by now: Roethlisberger on the road and Roethlisberger home, two completely different QBs. Um, he's averaged seventy fewer passing yards and two fewer touchdown passes per game uh, when he's on the road. So that's go. yeah. I, I don't even get that one. Like I've. I've pretty much watched Roethlisberger since I got into football just because I'm a Bengals fan and they always absolutely destroy them. The Steelers always destroy the Bengals. I'm, I'm not uh, I'm not delusional. So <laughs> um, watching Big Ben, he it, it's just like fucking Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I don't understand how he's so fucking bad on the road. How do you not figure that out by now? And I think Ben is – you know, everyone. That's, I think that's why everyone's so reluctant to say, "Yeah, Big Ben is elite." I do personally think he is one of the elite quarterbacks, but his his fucking road and home splits are impossible. Yeah, and it's he consistently does it. It's not like it's a fluke one year or he consistently is bad. Um, so, if you guys have ideas about owning or drafting Ben Roethlisberger, um, have a backup plan in place, please, because uh, he's historically shown us that he can't get it done for you. Um, on the road, just can't dude. Do he's it. still he's still getting drafted as a top ten quarterback in fantasy. Really? Like he'll yeah he'll go like where is he right now? I think he's quarterback three four. He might be ten. Six seven eight. He's not nine by my count, but I could be wrong. I counted on the fly. I don't know, but he's still there, and it still bothers me. People are still <laughs> trying to uh, to do. I think my first year in fantasy football. When I started getting into it with you guys, it, it it was like the Roethlisberger theory, and you just take him in like round eight or something. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Him. You're like, oh, he's always good. Yeah, but he's fucking terrible because <laughs> you well, get those half that half and half, and you just you don't want to play him every week. So there there are better people who take flyers on that are going after him, and you can do much better without Roethlisberger. Yeah, you don't you don't need that kind of negativity in your life. No, no at all, at all. So just. You know, just kind of fun things. I mean, you know, people talk about it. We've talked about it in the past. It's just, it's a, it's one of those things. You think after 13 years in the NFL, he'd have paid somebody some money to figure it out for him, but apparently not. Um, it's, an, it's an anomaly. It is definitely an anomaly. Um, let me see. I'm just trying to trying to see what we got. Um, wow. So here's some. No, it's not as good as I thought it was. All right. In 2015, Marshawn Lynch played only seven games and finished the year as running back 56. Um, so he finished this uh, the season ranked 43rd out of 44 qualified runners in yards uh, before first contact. And the only person worse than him in 2015 with that was Antonio Andrews. Who? Oh, um, my God. I remember him. Yep. Yeah. Titans. So, um, you know, just something to keep – 
keep in mind um, again about Marshawn Lynch and whether you believe, whether you don't. Good stats for Marshawn Lynch. It says right here in that same year he was ninth in rushing yards after first contact, and fifty seven point three percent of his rushing yards came after first contact, um, which is definitely a good thing um, because the Oakland Raiders were uh, only one of six teams in the NFL to average at least 120 rushing yards per game. Um, top six in the NFL in rushing touchdowns. So the opportunity is there for Marshawn Lynch. If he can stay healthy, if Beesma still got it, um, you know, they've got a good offense, you know, they're going to throw the ball, but you know, if Marshawn Lynch can still play, I'd like to see him on the field. He's going to be, I think, very interesting to watch in August. What's going to happen with his ADP, as we see him out there and kind of moving around because the Oakland Raiders, again, as it always pains me to say, are going to be good. (laughs) Yes, they are, man. They got one of the best lines in the game, but the Lynch shit, the more I look at it, the more it scares me. I don't know why the situation (laughs) couldn't be better. It really couldn't. It it's perfect. Like it is perfect. And then it's just, it, why is it so scary if it's so perfect? I'm just and that, but that, but that's why. <laughs> that's thing, but that's dude. why it almost seems like the fairy tale. Is it like the Mariota thing I was just talking about? The stats are too good, and it's just at some point it has to come back to earth. Yeah, it just um, it does the opposite to you instead of uh, making you content and happy. I, I guess, man. You know, I mean, Marshawn Lynch, like you said, in theory should should be great in Oakland, but it's you know Marshawn retired. He, he was out of football. You know. I don't know. I'm excited to have Walsh back on. You know, Walsh is going to be back in with us guys this July, uh, which uh, is here. Um, and I'm interested to hear him talk a little bit about Lynch and the Raiders. Because like you said, Raiders, one of the best O-lines. They're going to be a good team. They're going to win a bunch of football games. I don't know. I'm scared of Marshall Lynch as well. And there's no – I can't put it into words or on paper why. Yeah. And uh, it's it's overthinking it a lot, but – how how much are they going to use him throughout the season when clearly they're going to be looking for a playoff push? And they got bummed out last year when Carr went down week 16 with the fibula thing Yep, and completely shot their playoff hopes to shit. So I don't know if they're going to want to play it safe with him or limit him in any way. They certainly could because they have a lot of running backs that can get it done because they did it last year with about three of them. Jalen Richard, uh, Latavius Murray, there's one I'm completely missing, but they have a bunch of dudes that are capable and they're not afraid to share carries and they're very much an unselfish team in that way. So I'm just a little concerned about how, how many mouths there are to feed potentially that we might not even be thinking of because we think it's an afterthought when it really might not be. You're right. We know nothing. We know absolutely nothing. <laughs> we can we can only be scared, dude. Yeah, man, that's it. You 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 pray and you take a chance and you're terrified until you see if it works out or not. <laughs> um, all right, Benny. One last uh, one last fact here. I'm going to throw out for us to discuss uh, comes here on Jordan Howard. Um, it says Jordan Howard's rookie year, he had 1,611 yards from scrimmage and in and ten different games with more than a hundred such yards in the past five years only two running backs who carried the ball at least 250 times and averaged more yards per carry than jordan howard's 5.21 was jamal charles and adrian peterson both in 2012 so good company to be in yeah First very off. much so man and he uh he averaged 5.64 yards per carry on his 202 carries that he had against teams that won at least eight games last season so Pretty good. They were against good teams. It's not like he was running against, you know, schmucks. Um, only Ezekiel Elliott and Le'Veon Bell will enter 2017 with longer streaks of games with at least 10 fantasy points. Howard finished 2000, 2017 with six straight games of at least 10 fantasy points. Fuck, man. Fantastic. Yeah. That's f- freaking phenomenal. Uh, um, I've been looking at Howard uh, a lot because it's very intriguing because he can go anywhere from the end of the first to halfway through the second. Mm -hmm. And the comparison I can draw is probably, for me, is David Johnson from last year's draft where people were like, David Johnson's a shit. They pretty much had identical finishes to their season before they broke out. Like David Johnson two years ago went off from like week seven to 14 and I think Jordan Howard did about the same thing, like completely rattling off games of 10-plus fantasy points and yep. just going nuts. Uh, so 
it's not crazy to take him where he's at. I like Jordan Howard a lot, and I think he could pretty he he has a chance to be David Johnson like. Um, you know, it's it's obviously high praise comparing him to like the guy that probably will go number one in most fantasy drafts, but it's not unrealistic. No, when you look at what he's done, uh, comparable to each other, and kind of where David Johnson went last year was end of the first, uh, mid second. You're a hundred percent right, man. I didn't even think about the David Johnson comparison until you said it, but it is scary how how similar they are in those in those respects. And I mean, what a difference a year makes, man. I mean, Absolutely. last year, you know, last year we were like we were having a discussion around this time. David Johnson is he a fluke? He only did it for that those seven, uh, you know, week seven of fourteen. Can he keep it up? Obviously, he could. Obviously, he's legit, and you know that's why he's arguably number one overall. Um, you know. Jordan Howard, same thing, although it seems much more bought in based on uh, just what we've seen in the past and his production here moving forward. Yeah, for sure. And I think, um, you know, the Cardinals, if we're going to keep comparing David Johnson and Jordan Howard, the Cardinals don't have the greatest offensive line, and that's why I think David Johnson is clearly a better player right now. But the Bears have a nice offensive line that they've built over the years, surprisingly, and it kind of came to fruition last year, and they finally got a guy that they can give the ball to, so – Things things look shockingly safe for Jordan Howard and his upside where he's getting drafted currently. So yep, I I'm digging 100%, it. Hundred percent agree. Um, so uh, with that, that's uh, that's gonna wrap up the show here for you guys tonight. We gave you some facts. We talked about uh, three big names that were bothering us in ADPs. We talked a little bit about uh, you know some strategy and how you guys can't afford to just fuck up those picks and throw them away. And uh, our advice to you guys right now, guys. Get mocking. Enjoy your 4th of July. Drink, be merry, have some fun. Don't injure yourselves with fireworks. And uh, we will be back with you guys after the 4th of July holiday. Until then, we'll catch you on the flip side. This has been Let's Talk Fantasy Football. Thanks for listening.